Good evening, I'm Ken Schulman, the president of the board of directors of Boston Jewish Film, and I'm so pleased to have as our special guest tonight, Nadav Tamir. Uh, Nadav Tamir is the executive director of J Street Israel, which is the political home of pro-Israel, pro-peace Americans. He's on the board of the Mitvim Think Tank for regional diplomacy. He's also an advisor for international affairs at the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation and on the steering committee of the Geneva Initiative. In addition, we in Boston have fond memories of Nadav because he was Israel's Consul General of New England from 2006 to 2010. And finally, in the full spirit of this closure, Nadav is a close person, Nadav is a close personal friend, and he and I were classmates together in another life at the Harvard Kennedy School in 2004 when he was part of the Wexner Fellows. Nadav, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Ken, and it's so great to see you. And I have fond memories of you, of your family, of the Boston Jewish community, and of the Boston Jewish Film Festival. Awesome. So uh, what did you think of Apples and Oranges? Is it a realistic portrayal? Is, it, is the kibbutz that's shown in that film similar to the one in which you grew up? Yes, I mean, you know, it shows a lot more the perspective of the Scandinavians who came, uh, less of the Sabras, you know, Israelis who were there, but it's very much, uh, you know, the story that I remember. And we did have uh, volunteers, as we used to call them, uh, from different places in the world, uh, many of them from Denmark, some of them from the UK. I, I remember uh, this period very fondly. Tell me a little bit about growing up on, on your kibbutz. What was the name of your kibbutz? Um, the, the name is Kibbutz Manara. It's used to be the highest kibbutz in the world before the Six Days War, before the Golan Heights. It's on the border of Lebanon in the northern part of Israel. Now, I was a volunteer at Kibbutz Beit Alpha in the summer of 1974. And I remember for us, it was, it was a very romantic experience. It was like summer camp. And even at my tender age of 15, I understood that we were just there as visitors. We weren't really part of the society. And the people living there were the people that were pushing the kibbutz forward. Were you brought up with an idea that you were somehow building and reinforcing the country by being on a kibbutz? Oh, yes. My, my parents were... Um you know, from the group who established the kibbutz back in 1943, before the state of Israel was established. And it was, a, uh, it was all about Zionism and socialism, and uh, it was very ideological. And that was the spirit uh, where I grew up. I grew up that we are there, not just to, you know, live our life like everybody else, but that we have a mission. Uh, so I, I very much uh, felt, uh, you know, this spirit of pioneering that my parents and other people who built the kibbutz brought with them. Amos Oz once wrote that Israel's middle name should be Great Expectations. I can't think of a greater expectation in the movement of the Chalutzim than the creation of kibbutzim. Would you agree? Yes, uh, I mean, it was, uh, uh, you know, today, uh, sometimes people ask me, would you raise your uh, kids as they raised you, uh, you know, not with the parents, but in a, uh, in a, in a kid's home and, and, uh, and many of those things that look today a little uh, odd. And I, I would say, listen, it was different times. So even though I'm now in a different place and Israel is in a different place. The kibbutz movement is in a different place. But for the time that they did what they did, it all makes sense. You had to build a country and you had to do it, um, you know, to put aside individualism and materialism. And, uh, and, and that's why, even though today, sometimes we look at this at the kibbutzim as if it's kind of a, a something that is not natural, I think for those days and for my parents, it was completely natural. Now, were your parents uh, were your parents born in British Palestine? Yeah, they were Sabras. They were born in in Tel Aviv, um, and uh, even my grandmother from one side came from Russia. I mean, her parents came from Russia, but she was born in Jerusalem. So I'm a third generation uh, Israeli. You mentioned that today are different times. There were times that were different even before you and your family uh, went to your kibbutz in 1943, because the, the original kibbutzim, starting from the Ganya, um, they were peopled by 
immigrants from Eastern Europe who intended to be farmers. That was the freedom trail path for the first Aliyah and the second Aliyah. The idea was you would have collective settlements and you would, you would farm the land. That was a very different time. That was also the case in Kibbutz Manara, but in Kibbutz Manara, I would add, it was also about the border that, you know, we are sitting where the border is and we are in the fact that we live there, we protect the country. Uh, uh, to remind you, it was before uh, the, the war of independence. And uh, so it was very different times, but the belief back then before we even had a, a military was that the, those kibbutzim are creating the border of the of the new uh, Israel. If I recall correctly, in, in the Ganya Aleph, there's still a Syrian tank or an Egyptian tank in the in the in the, in the fence border. A Syrian tank, yeah. Uh, who uh, they kept it the way it was when they attacked the kibbutz, and it was stopped by the kibbutzniks with the uh, Molotov cocktails. Um, unfortunately. As important as the defensive role of kibbutzim was in the war for independence, and even before in defining Israel's border, kibbutzniks paid a very high price. I just read that of the 800 Israeli soldiers who were killed in the Six Day War, one quarter of them, 200, were from kibbutzim, whereas only about 4% of the Israeli population lived on kibbutzim. They played, paid a disproportionate price and played a disproportionately important role in the 67 war. Yeah, not only in the wars, also in the leadership of the country, the kibbutzniks were um, kind of a certain elite back then of people who followed their ideology. And it meant, yeah, um, also uh, in terms of the military service or, or before the military, Haganah, Palmach, eh, all the organizations. And later on, also in taking a major role in the leadership of uh, of the country, especially in you know in in the labor movement when uh, when it was still in power. Could you go into that a little bit more deeply? What was it about the kibbutz lifestyle that generated this generation of Israeli leaders? Well, because the founders of the kibbutz were very ideal, idealistic, they also raised the kids uh, this way. So we kind of were brought up. And, uh, you know, we lived on the border. We were under Katyusha rockets from Lebanon. And today, when I compare us to people in Sderot who are the victims of, of Gaza, I felt that we were not as um, vulnerable because we were full with this ideology from our parents. And we felt that, you know, uh, risking our life is part of what we're supposed to do for Zionism. So it was very different days uh, before, you know, now happily I could say we are a normal country in many ways. Uh, we're not in this stage of survival. So we see life very differently, like people see them all over the world. But in those days, it was very different. It was all about the mission. Do you think that that role of the kibbutz as an engine of social, uh, of, of survival, that role is no longer necessary? Does the kibbutz have a different role today in Israeli society? Yes, today we have a military. Today we have, um, you know, uh, uh, the state is, is established. And today um, the biggest threat to Israel is not a military. Uh, today the biggest threat to Israel in my view, and I know it's controversial politically, but today the biggest challenge for Israel is to find a solution with the Palestinians. Um, and because the, what is in danger is our identity as a homeland for the Jewish people and a democracy at the same time. So it's a very different uh, challenge. So if in the early days, the challenge was how to protect ourselves against our enemies, today our biggest challenges are in diplomacy and in making the right political decisions. It's always a question of identity, no longer a question of survival. Um, the kibbutz, for people outside of Israel, uh, and particularly non-Jewish people. It was a wonderful postcard. Uh, European socialists loved it. it. If you look back at the film, a lot of the volunteers were not Jewish. Of course, there were people like myself, you know, grew up in a middle-class home in, 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 as American Jews and going to 
going to a kibbutz for the summer was just sort of um, de rigueur. You were just going to do it. But for the Europeans, it had a very different appeal. Um, Israel doesn't have that same appeal for European socialists anymore. No. Well, Israel is not uh, uh, the socialist country that it used to be. And it's also um, not this kind of startup that it used to be. It's an established state. It's, it has one of the most dynamic economies in the world. Um, it has one of the strongest militaries in the world and definitely in the region. Um, uh, so it's not about creating a new place like it used to be, with, which was so romantic for many of those Europeans who came and also were very much um, attracted to this communal life. Um, and, and unfortunately, today also the, the, the politics um, make Israel much more controversial than it used to be. And for many Europeans, if back then we were kind of the, you know, the underdogs, the new country that came up from the ashes of the Holocaust, now we are the strong, uh, you know, the strong country in the region. And they feel more, uh, many of them feel much more sympathy to the underdogs, which are the Palestinians. Right. The image of the new Jew. I mean, you have, you have these Russian Jews, these Eastern, Euro Eastern European Jews fleeing poverty, fleeing oppression, fleeing pogroms, and they were going to build a new strong muscular Jew through sport, through farming. They were coming from places where they never saw the sun. Um, that image is pretty much um, obsolete. We have the new Jew now, but the new Jew in Israel seems to be an entrepreneur, seems to be an innovator, uh, seems to be the startup nation. Why can that not be used as an attractive postcard? For the rest of the it world. Is, it is attractive. I can tell you, you know, I'm, I'm partially also at the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation. We have people from all over the world coming to see this amazing phenomena of the Israel as the startup nation. And people admire um, the uh, creativity and innovation of Israel. Um, but, you know, people um, back then, it was not just about um, it was also about those values. Uh, and, and in terms of the values, we have now a, a much more conflicted country um, with a lot of controver controversies within on the future of how we, what we want to be and how we want to be. Uh, yeah, the startup nation is a draw. And Tel Aviv is a draw for many people around the world. It's one of the funnest cities in the world. So it's a different kind of attraction uh, than, than the kibbutzim, which was, uh, you know, it was a, a, a much more ideological and romantic uh, than, than the attractions that Israel is today. In the film, at least from my reading, they attributed a lot of the drop in popularity of the kibbutz abroad to the Lebanon war and to the situation with the Palestinians. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I think a lot of the drop of popularity and uh, a lot of the drop in kibbutz, the kibbutz movement in general is just an economic shift and a social shift. People don't want to live on farms anymore. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, being uh, working in agriculture was um, kind of a dream of the settlers to be the new Jew that works the land. And, and, but Israel is not exactly the, the, the perfect place for agriculture. We don't have a lot of water. We don't have a lot of land. So high tech is actually much more uh, the right thing for Israeli economy today. Not that I'm belittling uh, agriculture. I think we still we will always need agriculture, both for environmental reasons and also for uh, be self dependent. But uh, but Israel today rely a lot more about the high tech sector than agriculture. Agriculture was part of the dream of of connecting to the land and changing the destiny of the Jewish people. Um, you know, from Luftgeschäften, as they called it in the diaspora, to actually working the land, being strong, being able to protect ourselves, and changing this kind of um, image of the Jew. I know you're greatly concerned and greatly involved with relations between the two major Jewish communities on, on this planet, which are Israel and the United States. Was there a way that the kibbutz movement served as a bridge or as an invitation to link those two communities? Yes, even though I have to say is that as a kibbutznik, I, I wasn't very aware of my Jewishness. 
Um, I became much more aware of, uh, of my Jewishness when I served as a diplomat in America and when I was in Boston as part of the community. And then I realized that, uh, you know, the, the concept of Jewish peoplehood. Uh, but when I was in Israel, I was pretty uh, ignorant about the Jews in the diaspora. Later on, I used to look at them in a very instrumental way. You know, they help us, they lobby for us, they... Uh, um, it took me some time to understand that it's a, an extended family and we're brothers and sisters and we can't treat each other instrumentally and we have to find a way to do things together for a common vision rather than um, you know, uh, uh, kind of instrumentally use each other. Do you recall um, meeting American volunteers on your kibbutz when you were young? Yes, yes, um, but I have to say Americans, and I also um, remember it from my days as a backpacker in South America, Americans for some reason tend to be less, less curious about the world than other countries, uh, than other people. Um, and you saw less Americans just going there with a backpack uh, in South America or in Israel um, you saw more Americans in crews, in, in uh, big, you know, in, in expensive hotels. Um, maybe because when you're a superpower and when you live in a country that is so big as the U.S., you are, you know, you're not as curious about the rest of humanity. Uh, but I noticed that Americans were less. Um, I, I met them less in, in uh, you know, in, in the kibbutzim in Israel or uh, backpacking in other places in the world. During that summer I mentioned, 1974 at Beit Alpha, um, my Hebrew was good enough that I lived with the kids of the kibbutzim, but um, most of the Americans, most of the volunteers lived apart and had their own programs and they had ulpan and they had to study. And there was a, there was a great distinction and, and the, the kibbutz kids were a little bit dismissive of the volunteers. They were fascinated by them because they came from a world that the kibbutz kids only, dre only dreamt of. But there was a division and they realized that we were just temporary. Even, even me with my bad Hebrew, I was there for summer. You know, I went back to, when I go back to Israel, sometimes visit some of the people, but I wasn't committed to it. Yeah, but, but uh, there was a lot of attraction and uh, also young people, you know, um, uh, hormones were flying and uh, the, the pub in the kibbutz uh, dancing every night. And it was very exciting for young people. Well, we used to have Shabbat dances in the bomb shelter. <laughs> and, we, and my friend brought um, several records of Cool and the Gang, and they were very popular because you couldn't get those records at the time. Um, let's, let's shift a little bit. Um, you mentioned that Israel's main problem today is not building a country. It's not feeding itself. It's making peace. I know this is what you've worked towards for the bulk of your career. What's going on now? What can Israel do? What can the United States community do? Well, we can do a lot, a lot more than we're doing. Um, when you look at the polls in Israel, you see that most Israelis support the two-state solution. They understand that this is the right thing to do, but they kind of lost hope. And they don't think it's feasible anymore. And when they don't think that it's feasible, there is no energy there and they are voting on other issues. But I still believe that uh, uh, once the right leadership will come that articulate the vision, Israelis will support this process. And now that we have this kind of government that is very, um, you know, that have right and left and center, and they can't really make any decision about peace process, we definitely need some leadership from the US. And this is part of my work in J Street. Um, and the, um, I believe that the, the Jewish community has changed. You know, the, there was a generation that their experience was the Holocaust and the miracle of creating Israel. So they were kind of blindly supporting whatever the Israeli governments were saying because it was for them about survival. And at some point it wasn't about survival anymore. I mean, Israel is so much stronger than all of our neighbors combined. And now it's about making the right decision. And, and we have to change and understand that now it is about um, making sure that we remain 
the homeland for the Jewish people and a democracy. And the only way to do it is to find a, a, an accommodation with the Palestinians. And I completely believe that it is possible and that we have a partner on the other side. But unfortunately, many people don't share my view. So it's, a, it's an uphill battle. Well, you said before, with the right leadership, of course, that implies leadership on all sides, not just the Israeli side. Yes, yes, absolutely. But I think that also on that issue, uh, many of us still live in the past. In the past, yes, yeah, the Palestinians didn't want us there. The Arabs didn't want us there. After the Six Days War, there was a meeting in Khartoum, uh, Sudan, of, the, of all the Arab countries who said no to Israel, no to recognition, no to uh, peace with Israel. And now we have a completely different uh, context. Uh, the countries around us accept Israel. They understand that Israel is there to stay. We have uh, the majority of the Palestinians, uh, not Hamas, but the, the, the Fatah, the Palestinian Authority, believe in the two-state solution, uh, are willing to make uh, tough compromises. And for many of us, we still live in these times when we didn't have a partner and we kind of uh, can't let it go. While I believe that we do have a partner and we have to empower this partner and we have to remember that we are the strong side that have to take the initiative. And this is part of Zionism for me. Zionism was meant to change the destiny of the Jewish people from an object of history to a subject of history. And being a subject of history, meaning that we don't uh, need to be in the blame game and we don't need to wait until other people will solve our problems. We have to take the initiative and we can make peace. It is possible and we can do it. I have long right. believed that if left to their own devices, the Israelis and the Palestinians would form an, a, a viable accord, a viable two-state solution. There are other players, there are other stakeholders in this conflict, many other countries in the Middle East in whose interest it has been to prolong the conflict. Do you agree? Well, it used to be true for almost every country in the Middle East. And today it's only true of, uh, for Iran and its proxies. Um, most of the uh, Sunni countries, uh, understand that Israel is there to stay uh, and they want to work with Israel. They, they still want the Palestinian issue resolved because this is an open wound for every Muslim and every Arab and things that happening in the mosques in, in Jerusalem, in you know, the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount are influencing everybody, but they do want to solve it. They understand that Israel is there to stay. So that is a very different situation than we faced in the past and today, uh, the spoilers are mostly uh, Iran and some of the jihadists uh, in the Sunni part, uh, but, but it's not the majority of the Middle East. Is it the majority of Israel that you believe wants peace and wants a two-state solution? According to, the, to every survey, most Israelis want it. The problem is that those who want it don't believe that it is possible, and because of that, there is no energy there. So most of the energy are in the, in the extreme side, uh, mostly uh, with the settlers. You feel so much more energy there. Uh, so the, the challenge for us, for those who believe in peace, uh, is, to, is to bring back this energy. And the same energy that we saw in the demonstrations in Balfour uh, against the, you know, the Netanyahu government was uh, a reminder that we could gain this energy if we come together around this idea. Uh, this is the biggest challenge for the peace camp in Israel to bring this energy back because eventually Israelis will support it just like they supported Sharon when he moved out of Gaza, Gaza and supported Begin when he moved out of Sinai and supported even um, the, the twist in, from the Trump uh, so-called peace plan to the, uh, to the Abrahamic Accords because most people really want peace uh, and, and not war, but they, for too many years, they heard that it is impossible. And unfortunately, many of them uh, got convinced in that, and we have to change their minds. You've been a diplomat for decades, but before you were uh, a diplomat, you were in the military. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't you serve in the first Lebanon war? So you've seen war. Yeah, I was in the, in the first Lebanon war, and, and, and uh, I was uh, an officer in the armored forces after the war. Uh, mostly on the Golan Heights, but in some periods in Lebanon as well. Yeah, so I've seen war and uh, I've seen the horrors of war and I'm always amazed um, of the short memory of people who forget how awful war is. 
Did you, um, do you recall wartime uh, during your time in the kibbutz? Yes, our, our kibbutz was, you know, is still right on the border. So we, we felt, um, you know, we got missiles, we got intrusions of, uh, of, of uh, terrorists from Lebanon. Uh, we lived it all our life. It was very much part of, of, uh, of our childhood. Uh, today, the kibbutzim, I'm looking at it, it's, it's under 2% of the, of the Israeli population, but they do produce 40% of Israel's agriculture. So economically, it's still very important. Uh, yeah, even though agriculture is not as important in the Israeli economy as it used to be. Now with the globalization, you could get a lot of agriculture, um, you know, from Turkey, from other countries where it's much cheaper. So we still need uh, our local agriculture. Uh, it is important, uh, but it's but it's less of an economic necessity as it used to be. You mentioned my family, <laughs> whom you have very fond memories as to why. Our last family trip to Israel included, this was in 2011, it included a stay on a kibbutz. I don't remember which one. For me, it was sort of like visiting Sturbridge Village, which is a, you know, a, a pilgrim uh, reconstruction outside of Boston, because you're aware that these are not the kibbutzim that really mattered. Well, yeah, it, uh, I mean, back then they mattered a lot, but right now when people come, it's it's more of, uh, you know, uh, people who live there or people who don't like city life, who don't want urban life, but it's not the same spirit of, of the pioneers. It's just people who like to live in, in, in a more rural places and more communal places, but, but it doesn't have the drama that the kibbutzim used to have back then. Um, humans have this capacity for taking antiquated um, ideology and applying it often in a mistaken way to current events. You mentioned the settlers before who are pushing the boundaries. Are they in some way animated by that original pioneer spirit that did drive the early Zionists and that was so necessary? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and in many ways, uh, you know, those of, of them, because we cannot generalize, there are settlers that are, you know, racist to the Palestinians around them. And there are settlers who just want to live there in the biblical places. And it's very different people. Um, and I don't want to generalize all of them. The problem is that um, Israel in the 48 borders, uh, we could accommodate the Arabs uh, and make them citizens. But if we keep um, you know, the, the, the land where the settlers want to uh, stay, eventually we will not have a majority between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. And that means that we either will become another, uh, the 23rd Arab country in the Middle East, or we will become an apartheid state. And both scenarios are end of Zionism. I want to go back to the film a little bit. Uh, for me, with my, romantic, with my romantic nature and my romantic memories, it brought me back to a time that was a very happy time. And we were young and we were full of hope. Um, did that film uh, stir up any nostalgia for you, for your experience yes, in your kibbutz? Yes, absolutely. I, I, you know, I had a great childhood in the kibbutz. By the way, it's not all all kibbutzniks who feel this way. There, those who uh, were not as, you know, who were kind of different and had issues with living in such a collectivist life, had other experiences. But for me, I had a great, uh, a great uh, childhood and I enjoyed it. And I only remember uh, working in the fields um, with, the, with the volunteers and then uh, partying at night in the local pub. It was a great time and uh, I had a lot of nostalgia. Do you think the film is a realistic rendition of that experience? Yes, absolutely. It's a documentary. And of course, every film um, emphasizes other things, but it's definitely based on, on reality, on the reality that uh, of those um, um, volunteers, mostly Scandinavians who came to Israel. Well, I know your, your, your second home is Boston. I'm curious whether you have any opinion on the retirement of Tom Brady, former Patriot great. Well, Tom Brady didn't finish as a Patriot. He finished as a Tampa Bay player. Uh, but I, I remember uh, him in so many ways. I remember that when I was introduced to him by Bob Kraft, the first question he asked me was about Eud Olmert. He was very interested in Israeli politics for some reason. 
Uh, and, uh, um, and I remember the first game when I saw him winning his first Super Bowl. I was in, in New York back then. It was the World Economic Forum meeting happened in New York in solidarity with New York after 9-11. And I came in the delegation with Shimon Peres, and everybody, uh, you know, were dealing with the meetings. And I was thinking, where am I going to see the Super Bowl? And then we were invited by Bill Clinton, the whole delegation, to a Super Bowl party in his office in Harlem. And I was able to see the first Super Bowl where Tom Brady uh, was able to win Court Werner, who was so much more known than him as, as a as a as a quarterback. And since then. All my career in Boston, uh, Tom Brady was part of it. How many people can say they watched the first Patriots Super Bowl victory with Bill Clinton? That's amazing. <laughs> is there, uh, before, we, before we ring off, is there something you'd like to say to your friends in Boston? I miss them all. I love, uh, I love Boston. I love the Jewish community of Boston. I remember um, the film festival uh, that was part of, of uh, our life in the consulate. And uh, um, I, you know, all of all of my friends there. I just want to hug them. Unfortunately, we'll have to do it virtually. Thank you, Nadav. That was Nadav Tamir, the executive director of J Street Israel, former Israeli consul general to New England, and we've just talked about apples and oranges and the kibbutz movement. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Ken. Good night.